Hello and welcome to Sin Rumbo. I'm Philippe. Uh, in this video, I'm driving a 4x4 road that's taking me from basically the outskirts of the city of Mendoza in Argentina, where I live, up to over 3,000 meters of elevation. Uh, that's roughly 10,000 feet. And in this video, I want to explain to you how to prepare for a high altitude trip. A few months ago, my wife and I went to Bolivia. Uh, we drove the, uh, um, the Laguna route, uh, which is at uh, close to 5,000 meters, about 16,500 feet of altitude for three days. There's no food, there's no gas, and there's no mechanical help either. Um, so how do you prepare yourself physically? How do you prepare your vehicle? What gear to take? Um, how does the altitude affect your mileage? So stay tuned and we'll talk about this. So as you can see on the GPS, we are at uh, 3,144 meters. So the trail is getting a little narrower and uh, I think steeper ahead. But the landscape around here is just amazing. It's gorgeous and uh, there's guanacos almost everywhere I look. Um, so I'll keep going, see how far this goes. I'd like to see the view on the other side of the mountains, I think. It's gorgeous from here. So we're slightly higher here, 3,205 meters. It's flat enough here. It looks like uh, some people have camped before. This is a flat spot. I think I'll turn the truck around, park here, and uh, that's my lunch spot. So make sure you watch the video until the end. That's uh, when I will show the uh, 4x4 scenes. And I tell you the story of how I almost had to leave the truck in, uh, in the middle of nowhere and walk out. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe by clicking the little subscribe button in the corner and turn on the notifications so you won't miss the next video. So first things first, I'm gonna wash my hands and then I'll start uh, preparing uh, lunch. It's very nice to be able to come to these remote places and then arrive and you have your small home with you. See the fridge is running. I can wash my hands, I can cook. And if I like the place, I might even consider spending the night here. So I'll start with a green pepper. I'll put a little bit of that in my salad. We're going to put a few cherry tomatoes, they're fairly big so I'll slice them in half. Now when you're at uh, high altitude, your digestion uh, slows down, so you don't want to overheat, sorry, to overeat. Um, so you should eat things that are, if possible, easy to digest. <coughs> Avoid bringing uh, potato chips and greasy stuff that's gonna stay on your stomach. Uh, I've got a carrot, so I'll grate a carrot. 
All right, so the carrot is in. Uh, next, I have avocados, so. Which one? This one. Stuff life for fruits and vegetables in a four x four truck, because they bounce so much that they get damaged and sometimes spoiled, but try your best. So on this trip, like, there's no problem. I brought all the food I wanted and needed. Uh, Bolivia, South American countries are very restrictive about bringing food inside the country. So usually the best is to bring only uh, packaged food. And even then you have to be careful. Some stuff they won't let in anyways. Honey is a big one that they won't let in. Uh, of course, fresh uh, meat and meat products. And fresh fruits and vegetables, which for us is a big deal because being vegetarian, that's all we eat. So on the trip to Bolivia, for once, we brought uh, canned food. Not very much because cans are heavy. Uh, but we brought uh, dehydrated uh, food bags. And uh, nowadays you can find very healthy and very tasty um, dehydrated meals. So that's one thing to consider anywhere you live, you go to a camping and a hiking store, that sort of thing. And you will find um, dehydrated uh, meals. Uh, the thing when you're at high altitude, there's one very important thing is to drink lots of water don't wait to be thirsty drink regularly and more than you think is necessary the reason is that because there's uh, much less oxygen you breathe harder and you um, get dehydrated from uh, the moisture evaporating in your lungs and then being breathed out. So drink regularly, plenty of water. So a bit of olive oil, uh, salt, pepper. So about food at high altitude, there's one more thing I would like to say is uh, Whatever you pack, whatever you cook, whatever you eat, uh, don't eat too much. Uh, don't fill yourself up until you're stuffed because your digestion will have a really hard time and you'll have a harder time yourself doing whatever you need to do. Just first because lack of oxygen, we walk slower, we do everything slower. Everything is a lot harder than it is uh, lower. And uh, if on top of that you have a heavy meal staying on your stomach, like that's not gonna be fun. So try to sense when you're almost full and then stop there. And uh, if that's not enough food to take you to the next meal, then take with you um, like high energy bars, chocolate bars, nuts, stuff like that, that you can have as a snack in between meals. Um, Nuts are heavy to digest as well, so I would say chocolate bars are probably the best. Something that your body will absorb very quickly, you'll get a boost and you'll keep going and then at the next meal then you can have a proper meal. So before we leave the subject of food, I would like to show you how we organize ourselves uh, for cooking utensils and the food itself. We like those uh, storage uh, bins, boxes. Uh, they come with a lid that uh, keeps everything uh, inside and keeps mostly the dust out of it. But we have uh, two more boxes, smaller ones. We use a lot those um, aluminum dishes. They are good for soups, for salads, for pretty much everything. They are light, they are easy to clean and um, 
and yeah and easy to store you know they don't take you could have five six and wouldn't make much difference so here I've got salt pepper and stuff like that um, you know utensils for cooking and uh, the, the nice thing is that they stack up and they actually don't fall off like there's a bit of a an indent in the lid so the second one stays on top it fits in the space underneath the fridge so it works really well it keeps things organized so that concludes the subject of food now we'll talk about clothes what do you need to pack for those high altitude trips Clothes can be quite a challenge because during the day, like today, it's pretty hot in the sun. Like uh, in Bolivia at uh, 16,000 feet, let's say. During the day we were dressed like this, shorts, t-shirts, and the sun is hot. If you stay out in the sun, you have to wear uh, sun protection uh, and cover your head, cover your face with, you know, wear a hat, always wear good sunglasses with side protection like mountaineering glasses, sports glasses, whatever, but something that will protect your eyes from the direct sunlight and from the reflections uh, from the ground because um, there's a lot of rocks usually and no vegetation and because you're at the high altitude too, the atmosphere is thinner, so you get more uh, UVs uh, coming through. Uh, it's very important to protect yourself so you don't burn, because you won't realize it. The breeze is cool, like now it's very pleasant, so yeah, it, it is cool, but the sun is still hot. So you need light clothes, t-shirts, shorts, um, you know, light hiking shoes. The challenge is as soon as the sun goes down, the temperature drops dramatically, like in half an hour you go from warm and pleasant to cold, downright cold. Uh, here it probably goes down, I uh, will see tonight, but usually in the summer, this time of the year more or less, uh, I would say 10 degrees at night. So inside the truck I have a 6 degree difference, it's going to be 16, I won't be cold. But in Bolivia it went down well below freezing. Uh, I'm pretty sure one night we had 15 degrees uh, Celsius below zero outside. So the truck had some trouble starting in the morning a couple of times and it is cold like to sleep we don't have a heater inside uh, you need to get prepared so have for the evening if you want to do some stargazing stay out a little bit have warm clothes like winter clothes like uh, you know long pants good hiking boots um, fleece jackets um, even down jackets, I used my heavy um, down jackets that I bought in Nepal when we did the Everest uh, base camp trek. I rarely use it, but I used it in Bolivia, I was glad to have it. So for the day, uh, we'll need hat, gloves, bring gloves, like prepare for winter basically. And uh, at night for sleeping, if you have a propane heater, then good for you. You're going to be nice and toasty. Uh, if you don't, it is quite manageable. Uh, but to sleep, first sleep, not just with a PJ. Like we wear, uh, you know, a fleece um, top, long sleeves. Uh, we wear a nice PJ pants, hiking socks something to keep your feet warm. Dress well. Uh, if it's really cold, we sleep with the wool knit hat as well because you lose most of your heat through your head. So keep it covered at night. Um, and then we have a sheet like at home bed sheets. We have a wool blanket. Then we have two thin fleece blankets 
on top which keeps us warm down to a certain point. In Bolivia we packed a, a downfield a bed cover that we spread over the whole bed and that thing is thick and warm and, uh, and we were fine. As I say, mini minus 15 degrees outside, inside the truck was probably minus 7, minus 8, something like that. So well below freezing inside, but we were fine, like we slept very well. Definitely test all those recommendations for yourself. Go out, sleep in the cold, sleep as high as you can afford you know in your area or on a short trip try it try hiking at high altitude try staying two or three days try sleeping at night try cooking and test your stuff them and find out for yourself what works what doesn't what needs improvement but uh, this is my take on it Pre be prepared for the cold the altitude as far as clothing there's not much you can do but uh, clothing, yes, because you will get cold, for sure. So now we come to your own physical preparation. How do you prepare for uh, spending a few days at high altitude? There's no secret recipe. Uh, the more time you spend at high altitude, the better your chances of your body handling it uh, properly. It's a little thing that we did when we prepared for our trip to uh, Nepal, the, the Everest Base Camp Trek. Climbing stairs. It gets your body really working quickly and you can do it in town. You don't have to go to the mountains. So find an office tower that's you know open during the week and just climb the stairs go up and down once before going to work, once again uh, at night before going home. That will prepare your legs, it will prepare your lungs, your heart. Um, it will do you good and it's fairly easy and convenient if you can do it close to home. The risk of acute mountain sickness is real and life-threatening if not recognized in time. Like this is no joke, if you're at high altitude and you're not feeling well, that's a bad sign, you need to take action. But preparation uh, is what we're talking about today, so let me read a little further. The only remedy once you get altitude sickness is a drug called Dymox, which has some very serious side effects. It seems to work in most cases, but it does have some pretty nasty side effects. It can be taken as a prevention 24 to 48 hours before starting the trek. Now, you've guessed by being vegetarian and stuff, we try to avoid, uh, we try to have a healthy lifestyle, so we don't like the idea of taking drugs. Um, back then in 2010, before we did Nepal, I did some research if there was any alternative. I did come up with, um, with a team of uh, mountaineers from uh, Sweden who was going to attempt uh, Everest, like the summit, not just base camp, and uh, talking to naturopath and uh, so on, they did a prevention treatment based on uh, vitamins and it worked well for them. We tried it after talking to our own naturopathic doctor. Uh, we did it and it worked well for us too. We never had any, alt any altitude uh, problem in uh, Nepal. And again, we went up to 5,500 meters over 12 days, basically. So we took that vitamin uh, combination again before Bolivia and again we were fine no problems so it seems to work and it's just vitamins like there's no side effects to them if it doesn't work it doesn't work but it won't screw up your system 
So I will put the description on the screen, but basically what it is, three weeks before getting to the high altitude beginning of your trip, you start taking the vitamins. Once you get to the high altitude start of your track or drive, you can stop the treatment because the body will uh, well just acclimatize and then the vitamins are less effective it's just there's no point so three weeks ahead of the trip and it is <clears throat> vitamin C 1000 milligrams per day vitamin E 400 IU per day and lipoic acid 600 milligrams per day so those are uh, all three are uh, little capsules and uh, when you buy the boxes it tells you uh, how many um, I use like I think it stands for international units I'm not sure or uh, milligrams you have per capsules so you know how many to take every day and because you need that treatment every day for three weeks you can calculate how many boxes you need to buy uh, vitamins get quality vitamins don't get the cheap supermarket stuff uh, if you're gonna do it do it right um, so again that uh, has worked for us uh, twice it worked for these people and uh, other than taking the drug just before and once you get sick there's no uh, no real um, other way to handle it so I definitely can personally recommend this other than that for your own preparation I would say that's it so to summarize start with as good a physical condition as you can climb stairs uh, near your house or your building or uh, some office building eat well and healthy get rid of toxins in your body drink lots of water on your trip as well eat as healthy as you can drink lots of water again to eliminate toxins and to keep your uh, body hydrated as we said earlier and then uh, do the treatment three weeks before you start your trip and hopefully you'll be fine and you'll enjoy it now in South America they do uh, recommend chewing on coca leaves uh, it, that's better and I know I did it for a few days it kind of bothered my stomach a little bit um, it seems like uh, teas um, is easier for us who are not accustomed to drink, drinking or chewing those leaves. So if you're in Peru, for example, all the hotels will offer and restaurants too will offer those teas all day long. And uh, that helps too. It gives you a bit of a boost and it helps you um, cope with altitude. So if you're in Peru, for example, don't hesitate. Actually, the tea is quite pleasant to drink. If you have problems, the hotels, most of them have big uh, oxygen tanks. And uh, if you get back to the hotel, excuse me, if you get back to the hotel and you feel dizzy or you don't feel well, you can always use uh, supplemental oxygen we again never had to use anything like that not even close but uh, look at it as, uh, as an ex a very pleasant experience it's different it's special but if you prepare well you'll have a good time you'll enjoy it and everything will go fine so these are my recommendations as far as uh, health and fitness for high altitude trip so one thing I always carry with me in the truck or in my backpack is my spot uh, satellite messenger. I can uh, send friends and family um, preset messages that tell them where I am exactly by GPS and uh, that I'm okay. And uh, worst case scenario I can send an SOS message to um, 
uh, search and rescue via satellite uh, not depending on cell phone and they'll locate me uh, exactly with pinpoint GPS precision. So that's a device I really recommend or something similar like this one is a number of years old now there's newer ones but the idea remains the same. So we've discussed food, we've discussed clothing, and uh, we've discussed uh, physical preparation, health, fitness. Don't go away, because next we're going to talk about this. So my idea about uh, a vehicle for such a trip I want to keep the vehicle as close to stock as possible. You can always buy more accessories, it's like insurance in case of this, in case of that. But uh, you end up loading and even overloading your vehicle and then stressing the engine, stressing the suspension and uh, compromising reliability. So you'll see on this vehicle the modifications are very limited. So we're going to take a close-up look, we'll start from the outside, we'll go around and then uh, I'll show you the kind of gear that I packed for this sort of uh, expedition. So the most important modification done to this vehicle, tires and suspension. The stock tires that come with most uh, 4x4s are called all-terrain tires by the manufacturer but the reality is that they're mostly uh, oriented towards uh, highway performance um, noise from the tires, comfort, fuel economy and uh, they're usually not designed for any serious off-roading so the first thing you want to do is get better tires, like really um, off-road uh, tires. Uh, you want to think about the size as well, because uh, again for performance and a lot of factors, the tires are usually a little small. So on this vehicle I've gone with uh, Pirelli, which is not a common name in uh, off-road tires, but they are actually manufactured in Brazil and they're uh, easily available here in Argentina at a reasonable price. So again, these are Pirelli Scorpion MTR, which means they are uh, technically a mud terrain tire. Uh, they're a serious off-road tire and uh, as far as size I went a little taller than stock those are 265 um, 75 R16s uh, so they're about uh, four centimeters uh, larger in diameter not quite uh, two inches than stock, which gives me a bit of uh, gain in ground clearance. And also, uh, because the tires are taller, the obstacles in comparison are a tiny bit smaller. So uh, They're also a centimeter, so less than a half an inch wider than stock, so not a big difference. They're mounted on the factory steel rims. Why? After considering going with alloy rims and so on, a steel rim will take more impact without breaking than a cheap alloy rim. And if you do damage a rim, a factory a steel rim is easy to repair or obtain pretty much anywhere. Now if you have fancy alloy rims, then they'll probably break they are not going to bend, so they are not repairable. And then if you're a in a remote area of the world, then good luck finding the exact same one. It's probably going to be a challenge. So I think for serious overlanding, uh, steel rim is the way to go. The truck came with 16-inch rims, which is 
pretty much ideal. I wouldn't go much taller or smaller. Uh, 16 is a good compromise for uh, tire thickness that you have here between you and the obstacles to absorb the, the shocks. Uh, if you go with uh, 17 or 18 or 19 inch rims then you end up with low profile tires. They're not good off-road because then you have very little tire left to absorb uh, shocks. Now to accommodate larger tires you're going to need the usually some kind of uh, suspension uh, lift otherwise your tires might end up rubbing in the fenders mostly when you turn the wheels and the suspension goes up and down during off-road so on this vehicle again I've done um, a very minor uh, suspension lift so actually the kit that I have increases um, the ride by four centimeters so not quite two inches and uh, I'm going to show you in a minute, but it's just uh, basically a thick uh, spacer that goes between the shock absorber and spring and the uh, tower itself. So it raises the vehicle above the suspension and it's fairly minor. So other than realigning your, um, your steering, uh, you don't need any other modifications. So the red thing that you can see in there is the spacer. So it's a fairly simple modification that doesn't really compromise the reliability of the vehicle. So that's for the front. When I lifted the front I didn't need to lift the back quite as much. So again four inch, um, four centimeters of lift at the front and only three at the back and that's done through uh, just uh, spacer blocks between the axle and the um, suspension springs. So the next modification that we can uh, find outside this truck is the roof rack and uh, so up there I carry all the time a pair of recovery boards and um, that's where I keep uh, uh, extra jerry cans of uh, gas oil. I've loaded up to three jerry cans of 20 liters each. So I was at the full weight for the, the roof bars, but uh, they held up pretty good. So now that we've talked about the outside of the truck, I'm gonna show you all the gear that I carry with me. So we're going to start with the very back. In this, uh, this bin here, at the very bottom, I have a set of uh, snow chains, tire chains. They're mandatory here in the mountains because of the altitude, it can snow pretty much uh, any time. So they are mandatory year round. So here at the back, I also carry <coughs> a little bit of engine oil some uh, windshield uh, fluid, uh, but nothing else. So let's move over to the cab and I will show you all the gear that I keep. And uh, I'll start with the uh, glove box. I carry a digital meter, a couple of uh, small handheld radios. Uh, this is a engine uh, error code reader. I hope you can see it. So it plugs into the uh, factory port uh, under the dashboard and it will read the error codes and the ones that can just be cleared it will clear them. Otherwise you can know if uh, the error is something serious and you're really stuck or if you can continue driving until the next town. This is something I made myself. It plugs into an outlet, uh, you know, in campgrounds and lets you know if there's power or not. Because there's no point setting up uh, just to find out that the power outlet doesn't work. So now I'm going to lower the seat and show you what's behind. Thankfully there's 
about 20 centimeters of space uh, down there to uh, carry some stuff. Again, it's mandatory. I can't remember in Peru and Bolivia or some places you need to have uh, wheel chokes. I thought if I buy some, I might as well buy good ones. So next we have a tire repair kit. Uh, it came with a pair of work gloves, pliers, uh, tire pressure gauge and basically all you need to uh, repair a punctured tire. I have the factory um, jack stored back there, that's where it goes. But I also have a hydraulic uh, bottle jack. So this one is a 6 ton, uh, not sure what kind of ton that is, if it's metric or not. So now we'll move around to the other side. So I'll start over there. This is my uh, phone GPS. Uh, it's bolted onto the, the console here. So it doesn't, uh, the phone doesn't fall off when I drive. I'll show you the navigation app uh, at some other point. Here there's a little storage thing so I keep a uh, headlamp, flashlight, a multi-tool, that's probably what I use the most, uh, tire pressure gauge. So on top I have an air compressor, uh, you probably know that uh, when you do a lot of uh, off-road driving, depending on the terrain you need to lower your tire pressure. Your tires are part of your suspension, uh, if they're not pumped hard they'll absorb some of the uh, vibrations, uh, impact and uh, when you uh, get back on the highway you need to uh, pump them up again. So this is nothing fancy uh, just a 12 volt uh, heavy duty compressor that's my toolbox so we'll leave that for later I'll show you uh, in a second what's in it and here I have a shovel a camp shovel there it is foldable so again it can be uh, useful in case you get a wheel stuck somewhere you can dig a hole move some dirt finally the best purchase I've made in a long time and again I'll show you what's in it and that's what I used the most on the um, Atacama expedition that's a set of socket wrenches and so on I'll show you in detail in a second so socket wrenches I really recommend having a good set with you so now we come to the toolbox that's the biggest part um, the top here I have uh, replacement fuses, that's for the camper, for the truck itself, all kinds of fuses, some uh, electrical plastic ties, those zip ties, I'm sure you know what they are. They are convenient for a whole bunch of different things, so I always carry a few. Um, some uh, plumbing tape, some electrical tape. Uh, and there an assortment of screws, bolts, a uh, few Allen keys for different things on the truck. I keep them all here. And um, that's it for the top part. Okay. Uh, that's some uh, liquid to wash the truck. Um, wire brush set to uh, uh, clean the battery terminals, that sort of thing. Mm, here some hand tools, so a variety of hand tools, uh, pliers, hammers, screwdrivers, uh, electrical wire cutters, a whole bunch of different things in this cotton bag. Uh, jumper cables, in case. <laughs> um, oh, those are 
straps for the recovery board because uh, the last thing you want is to drive over your re uh, recovery boards in mud and then once you're out of the mud go and look for them and you can't find them because they are buried in mud so with these um, clips I can tie a yellow strap there's two straps two clips to each board <coughs> and then find them. Hopefully the straps will stick out of the mud. Some uh, duct tape. Uh, Canadians, we uh, <laughs> live by duct tape, so... Uh, this is um, heavy-duty stuff, like you can repair actually, uh, you know, a torn bag, uh, whatever, keep things together. It's a lot of different uses. And then finally, at the very bottom, the uh, toe strap. All right, so a couple of uh, heavy duty shackles so you can tie the strap to the vehicle or vehicles and uh, that's the toe strap so this one's uh, really really sturdy. So finally I want to talk about the performance of the vehicle because I know that myself before I uh, went on this trip I was concerned uh, mainly with fuel consumption at uh, high altitude uh, and not being able to get gas for three days there was no gas station. Um, on the internet either the information that you will find is highly technical or uh, it's basically non-existent. My experience was, as far as performance, uh, the truck behaved really well. And even though we were loaded as we had never been, uh, the truck uh, handled it really well. It climbed steadily. And as far as mileage, so I'm thinking we might have made it just on one full tank without any reserve. Um, you do consume more off-road of course the fact that you're at the altitude I'm not sure it had that much of an effect I mean what you uh, consume more going uphill climbing to those altitudes you can make it up going downhill if you manage your speed you can make up what you um, consumed on the way up so I would say overall, I don't think the fuel consumption was much higher than uh, normal. Maybe a little bit, but not much higher. Still carry spares, uh, spare fuel, because uh, you never know. So it's just uh, increased safety. So overall, I didn't use any of the recovery gear. The truck behaved really well. Uh, we didn't break anything, uh, nothing worn out. The tires handled everything really well. Very happy with that. So I would say if you prepare well, if you uh, plan properly, do your research, um, no reason not to do a high altitude uh, overland trip. It's going to be an amazing experience. Uh, I know South America is great for that. Like, this is lovely and I mean, there are amazing landscapes, uh, solitude. So I hope you'll, uh, you'll have enjoyed this video, you found it useful. Uh, if you have any questions, concerns that uh, I haven't uh, addressed in this video, please feel free to um, uh, post your question in the comments below. I try to answer uh, questions and uh, reply to comments uh, as much as I can. And um, if you haven't already, please subscribe and turn on the notifications so you won't miss any of the future videos.
beautiful day today. A few clouds, but it's much nicer here than in town. The air is a lot cooler, even though the sun is warm, but that's nice. Um, I just uh, spotted some guanacos there, the camel family. Uh, very common in the Andes, as soon as you get up to altitude and uh, remote areas. There's actually two herds uh, in front of me, which I'll show you in a minute. Gorgeous place, quiet. So, I'll keep moving because we're getting close to lunchtime and I'd like to make some progress. slowly climbing but uh, very gently further we're gonna hit some other parts where we climb steeper and eventually we'll reach to the uh, highest point on the route at uh, 3,000 meters So beautiful here, I decided to stay for now and uh, go hiking towards that mountain, see what the view is like on the other side. It's just gorgeous here. Uh, I just saw um, guanacos again, they're not too happy seeing me here. They make their weird noise, but... And this is the other side of that mountain that I was showing you at the very beginning. Well, I've reached the end of the trail. Behind me is just a drop on both sides, so a couple of crosses to remind you that it's dangerous. And uh, that's it. I think it's a condor flying up over the summit there. I've seen a couple earlier flying uh, right overhead. So I've decided to camp here, it's very quiet, there's not a sound. I'm surrounded by wildlife, there's guanacos that go up on the hill just across. There's some black and white birds that have been, have been perching on the left side here. There's condors flying up uh, high in the sky, I, I don't know, it just feels good here, so I'm gonna stay tonight here. And, uh, well, tomorrow I'll see.
Hello, well, after the climb <coughs> that you just saw on the other side, I decided to go down this side of the mountain. It turned out to be a mistake I just barely recovered from. Uh, going down was not too bad, then the trail seems to be okay, but actually there's a spot where it's really narrow and uh, kind of sideways with a big chunk of the trail missing uh, due to erosion. I didn't think it was safe for me by myself to attempt it. There was not really a flat section down there, but anyways, I had to turn around somewhere. It's just loose rocks, loose dust. It took me quite a while to turn around and then get started again like the truck was just spinning I could smell burnt rubber from the tires and maybe the clutch I don't know and I wasn't going anywhere so I had to back up a couple times and uh, finally got somewhat of some traction and uh, well I'm back where I started <laughs> So I'm going to turn around and head back where I came from and take the normal route. It's too bad because I think this one, I was very close to the junction that would have taken me uh, down the big hill where I camped last night. But anyway, that's life. I'm just happy to be back somewhere where I think I can get out of. So as you can see behind me, over there, those trails, they're often almost single tracks. In places they are, there's no, no room. Well, there is room for a 4x4, but the trail is not made for cars and trucks. So you have to kind of drive on the side and uh, it's a lot of fun, but I think I had my share for today. So the closer I can get to the main track, the happier I'll be. I think I've passed the tough spots. I didn't show you everything, but there was a bit of a climb earlier with rock steps, but didn't turn out as bad as I thought when I saw it first in the other direction. So I think I'm good. Fingers crossed. So I've reached my destination campsite for the night. It's not the most romantic, but usually it's very quiet.
I arrived at the new campsite. I intended to spend the night here, but uh, I'm not sure if I will stay. It seems to be very windy. Uh, it's beautiful though. It's like a platform on a very steep climb. So after doing some reconstruction work, I moved some rocks and I was able to park the truck much closer to those big rocks. Hopefully I'll be a little more sheltered. I'm not sure it's quite windy here, but I love the place. It's beautiful. It's the first time I will camp here. I just uh, had a nice salad with tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, avocado, uh, grated carrot, a green pepper, and now I'm making uh, gnocchi with uh, sauteed vegetables. Not sure what's going on, but you can see clouds rolling in and uh, coming down the valley across. I don't know if in a few hours tonight I'll be in fog or not. I've been uh, off the grid now for five full days. <coughs> I was planning to stay <coughs> six and a half. I looked at my supplies earlier and uh, it looks like tomorrow I'll have to drive to town which is 20 k's uh, from here uh, mostly to get some water I'm running out at the same time of uh, drinking water and uh, just water to do dishes and wash myself and so on so it looks like by myself I'm using 6 liters a day so I will have uh, run through uh, 30 liters more or less. Um, food wise I can probably uh, I could stay another couple of days I think uh, and I could have packed more like the fridge wasn't full when I left um, so I'll be good for food but uh, tomorrow I'll get some uh, drinking water and uh, well I'll take advantage of being into <coughs> in town to buy some fruits, vegetables, just for the day and uh, have enough for uh, breakfast, lunch and the day after and then I'll be home sometime in the afternoon. So it's good to know I can be at least five days uh, off the grid with this little thing and I'm thinking I could probably carry a 20 liter jerry can of uh, drinking water and that would add another three days more or less. <coughs> to that uh, time uh, in the wild so which isn't bad basically I can stay well over a week so for navigation as I had mentioned I use an app on my um, Android phone that's called uh, map factor navigator which I really like it's a free app it's available for Android and um, iOS. I use the free version so once in a while I get the message you just saw that uh, is asking me if I want to continue with free or if I want to buy the full app which comes with TomTom Tom Maps. Uh, I'm quite happy with the uh, free version because the uh, maps that uh, are used are open street maps and I find them very detailed, very convenient. Uh, what I like about this app is I can download a whole country in uh, one block and have the map available offline. The downloads are fairly quick, uh, updates are automatic when you're connected to Wi-Fi. So for example on the Atacama expedition I had the whole country of Argentina, Chile, Peru and Bolivia. And they're contiguous maps so you can cross uh, borders, navigate from one country to the other and there's no problems. 
uh, unlike some apps that will uh, have you download uh, sections of maps along your route uh, I find that very inconvenient very slow and um, w with this system I can go anywhere in the country and um, and never find myself outside of any map um, so <coughs> you have um, of course map to see where you're located I'm not sure if it's gonna work because I just turned it on but uh, that's what you get uh, my places is where you store your waypoints you can organize them in folders and you can plan your routes that way uh, navigate of course to uh, <coughs> navigate your route uh, this one search allows you to search uh, points of interest, uh, towns, cities, that sort of thing. Uh, route info is your uh, series of waypoints and um, you can choose what kind of routes the system will use for uh, guidance. So if you're hiking, of course, you want access to the smallest trails. If you're driving uh, highways, you might want to eliminate like secondary roads and stuff. And uh, this one, tools uh, have different little things. I use uh, GPS info, which uh, is nice because right from the app, you can see your uh, GPS status, altitude, uh, waypoints, um, coordinates if you need. So I'm, I've been using this app for several years now and I really like it. Uh, it's worked well for me, I'm quite happy with it. And uh, even trails like uh, the one I used to come here, which are in the middle of nowhere, uh, will be uh, on the GPS. I will show you in a second. You can see the, the little trail here and then um, my waypoint, uh, the camping spot marked here. So, so again, Map Factor Navigator. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's free. It's an easy download and um, uh, offline maps of a whole country or at least large sections of countries. So this is the last uh, day, half day. I'm gonna stay here until lunch and then drive home. So after breakfast I'll see, uh, I might go for a hike and then uh, make lunch and uh, drive home and uh, I will have spent uh, a week at uh, 3000 meters or higher uh, other than yesterday when I drove to town to get uh, some water and uh, fruits and vegetables otherwise I was uh, completely by myself for a week, completely off the grid, everything went well, it was really enjoyable, really nice to uh, be in silence like this, peace, just amazing. So thank you for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, well again, if you haven't subscribed, uh, Please click the subscribe button in the corner and uh, turn on the notification so you won't miss the next videos. Thank you very much for watching, for subscribing and for supporting my channel. Thanks a lot and uh, hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, bye.